Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Here we go. (laughs) Very fancy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. I am your host, Lisa Woolfork, and I am, once again, as I always say, honored and delighted and so excited to bring up um, our guest for today, who I am going to welcome with Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. I am here with So Modest Studios, uh, creative director, owner, producer, manager, head designer, teacher. What did you say? The teacher. Teacher, teacher, professor, designer. I'm sure she also sweeps up at night. Um, She does it all. Welcome, Lateri. Thank you so much for being here. And so, So Modest is an amazing brand of stylish, beautiful, modest clothing that is really inventive and engaging. If you look at the pieces, they are so elegant, deliberate, (laughs) well-structured. They're just amazing. It is exactly what one would imagine from a fashion designer, right? A fashion designer who's not just trying to reinvent the wheel or put a stamp on something that's already existed. She is actually designing. And I'm also so excited to have Letary here because like my work with Black Women Stitch, her work with So Modest Studios is also a values-led project. Black Women Stitch centers Black women, girls, and femmes in sewing. And Letary Mosin, her work is values-aligned as well. And so she is able to be able to move through the world and also help her community move through the world in ways that are deliberate and beautiful and powerful and aligned with their values. So thank you so much. Welcome. I'm so so introduction. (laughs) I'm like, I got a black Muslim. Here you in my pocket and you just like... It's just like, it's all, it's all perfect. So welcome so much, Letary. Can, can you give us some idea about how you got started? How did, what's your sewing story? So um, I've been sewing ever since I could like crawl. Like, honestly, I started hand sewing when I was about five years old. I was that person that anything you gave me, I was stripping it naked and making something else out of bed sheets, socks, jeans. All of my younger cousins have participated in like some form of a home fashion show where I <laughs> tied bed sheets and anything that they would let me cut <laughs> and then twist and tie and design them a dress. We would do makeup, hair, like gather everyone, like it's time for the runway show. Um, so I feel like it's definitely something that's just been in me forever. I, I've always known that I've wanted to pursue a career in fashion design. Um, I think, so if you know a little bit about my background, I I spent about 13 years working in HR, in (laughs) HR technology and from talent management to talent acquisition. And, um, you know, realistically, I knew what my dream was, but I, I wasn't in a position to like go to art school, right? So I couldn't risk (laughs) <laughs> spending my, you know, my scholarship opportunity, my chance to like get out of the hood and then end up with an arts degree that nobody really took seriously. Um, mm. So my undergraduate, I had a triple major. I studied business management, uh, fashion merchandising and marketing with the minor in communications. Um, sounds like four majors. That. Okay. Just a quick, <laughs> that sounds like four majors um, that with the minor in communication, that's, that's a lot, to, even as a minor, to minor in communications, because I majored in communications. So even to mm-hmm. minor in communications is a big deal. So you have four majors. Continue. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
So I think that there was one part of that dream where um, it was like, this might end up being a hobby and you need to have like a real career plan, real career opportunities. After so many years of working in corporate and um, we can we can get into the tea, but a very, let's say, sexist and borderline racist, borderline Islamophobic boss. Um, oh. <laughs> I always tell the story is like, uh, if you watch, what was that show? Everybody Hates Chris. I had a, my man has two jobs. Got him open. Like, I don't need oh this. Oh my gosh. Yes. Tell I, do not, I don't need this. I don't need this. I don't this. need this. I don't need this. Um, like, we have always lived very much under our means, right? So it's like, mm-hmm. yes, I was working at a high paying corporate job, but we bought a small house without a mortgage. You know, I have a, yes. a little hoopty car that it runs <laughs> and it gets, I don't it have a car more. So it was like right. all of these things that force you to stay into a position that you hate. You know, we really was, and my husband was so supportive about that too. It's like being able to say, you know, it's time to pursue something else. Um, yes. And I am very big on like words. So there, uh, above my bed and at home, I wrote, if I can't follow my dreams, I don't know what to do. And I wrote mm. that and it just sat there for like maybe five months. Um. And one day I decided, like, I'm going to open a studio. Like, I'm not going to go back to corporate. I'm not, I'm not going to go back to corporate. <laughs> it's just like, I'm not going to do this. Like, just having that, to tell myself that, you know, convince myself. Like, it's okay to follow your dream. It's okay, um, you know, sometimes you grow up in environments where you feel like, you have to constantly remember survival, you know? So it's like you're in a place where you can risk the study paycheck nine to five and really pursue that. You're not in a survival mode anymore. Um, So really having those conversations with myself out loud, like gearing myself up (laughs) to, to follow this thing, to open the studio, to invest my savings, to files, machinery, and equipment, and mannequins, and all this stuff. And then uh, three months after we opened, we were shut down for COVID. (laughs) So needless to say, there was lots of tears and lots of moments where I was just like, I don't know if we're going to reopen. I don't know what that means for anything um, for this investment. But you know, thanks be to... Thanks be yes. to God. You know, that's what that means. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, yes. Yes. We had just such an outpour of people in the community that were reaching out to me, even when we were in shutdown and we weren't allowed to be open. They're like, well, as soon as y'all open, let me know, because I'll be there with a the mask on. I'll wear a vena, I'll Whatever I got <laughs> like, to do. Exactly. Um, and exactly. Oh, it was just overwhelming. Like I would sometimes just cry at night because people were signing up for another class and another class and returning students. And I'm just like, I can't believe that you want to be here. You know, <laughs> it's just like you want to be here. Like this is crazy. your story. And what I think, what Latari, what your story is showing me is that you have what you're sharing is what it means to step out on faith and what it means to. To also to remind yourself that what you want for your life is important. Mm -hmm. And that I I think that sometimes coming from a background of financial marginalization or where you're used to struggle or used to like, oh, no, no, I can't let go of this because then I won't have that, you know. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think that's such a dangerous idea because it kind of says, well, only people who are rich can afford to dream. Right. Only right. people who are rich can afford to take chances. Mm. Only people who are rich can do blank. But if you are if you are a working person and you are working for a living, all you can do for the rest of your life is plan to work. And mm-hmm. your dreams, your right. pleasure, right. your joy, none of these things are important because you mm-hmm. are just meant to survive and that's it. And right. that is not who we are. 
That is not who we are. We are not people who are just meant to survive. There is far more to us. And and I've, I've been thinking so much about pleasure and joy and basically how we practice freedom. Right. And and I've been going with um, Alexis Pauline Gums. She has this idea that says freedom isn't a secret. It is a practice. Mm. Freedom isn't a secret. It is a practice. Is a practice. And when I heard you saying... You know, I grew up in, you know, when I went to college, I had to get a job that would pay. I had to get a job that would guarantee a source of steady income. And whether I was happy or not was secondary. Right. You know, you took, you paused and you said, I don't know if that's true for me. Because what you said is, if I can't follow my dream, I don't know what to do. That your dream was so central to the life you wanted to have for yourself. And thanks to your family and your husband and your community, people came together in response to what you wanted, right? To help support your vision. And that's the thing I'm so excited about. I just saw this today, this woman I really love, her name is Octavia Rahim. And she Mm -hmm. says, the things that, you know, some people are afraid to speak out loud what they want because Mm. they're afraid it won't happen. Right. Mm -hmm. But then she but she said the thing that you want also wants you. And that you're kind of just me that the universe is conspiring. And what you're telling us right now is proof of that. Right. You wanted to have the studio. COVID said, hell no, you can't have no studio because everybody's staying home forever. Um, But you had people contacting you even when the studio was closed saying, Mm -hmm. hey, can I give you some money now to buy some classes ahead of time? Uh, What can I do to help you get going? I want to be there. And it really is a great example, I thought, of these this two these two, you know, what you want and what the community also needed came together. What's also really beautiful, Lisa, is like I feel like there's even another level to that. Right. Because. I I have been a practicing Muslim only for seven years, right? So I was studying fashion and like went to London and did all these things before becoming a Muslim. And then after I did my Shahada, which is like, you know, the statement of faith, there was this sort of rift of like, well, you can't be a fashion designer and be a modest woman. You can't, you know, be bold with beautiful colors and, you know, still hold on to these conservative values. And so that was another level that I felt pushed me away from the dream, away from um, really pursuing that and made like corporate make sense. Like it's easier to exist in this corporate space and not really, you know, take up too much space, not really do the things or wear the things that I want to wear, or express myself in the ways that I want to express myself Um, And so that's like even another layer to it. I always say like, it's really, it's really so many layers um, to the process. But one thing that you spoke about is like saying things out loud. Like to me, I am, I am such a huge uh, person on words. Like I, I I just, even um, in my studio, I have pictures. I have like tons of quotes mixed in. If you go in the bathroom, Like, there's, like, quotations all over the walls. It's, like, one of those things where I feel like I need to be reminded to live out loud. I need to be reminded that I have permission. Um, Like, I didn't, when I became Muslim, one of the big things was, like, not losing my identity, you know? I'm not an Arabic woman. Even though I'm married to an Arabic man, I am not an Arabic woman. I am a Black woman. I am very proud to be a Black woman. I am a Black American woman, and I dress as a Black American woman. And so it's like, when you Google modest clothes, what do you find? (laughs) You know, you find Indian wear, you find Arab wear, you find um, African, like central to the continent, African wear. But you don't find much that really represents like a Black, Muslim, American, (laughs) like all of these ladies. Sensibility, yeah. Um, And so that was another element too, another layer that I felt like I had to really push through. And a lot of that was talking to myself out loud, giving myself permission and and just realizing like, okay, there's always going to be somebody who don't like it. There's always, there's, there's people who complain like, why do you use 
this in your show and it's just like it's my show so <laughs> you know exactly yes yes <laughs> this is why i use it because it you you know you already answered your own question when you said why do you the answer is in the question because it's mine right <laughs> yeah when you do your show you can do it any way you like and you can believe i will not come over there and ask you why Hey, I'm going to support or I'm not going to support that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So I, I hear you saying that what you what I recognize in your work is that you are making really important interventions in conversations around modesty, fashion, identity. Right. And that's something that I really love about the ways that you have mantras and motivations and inspirational quotes written inscribed in your space to remind you all the time and to remind your clients and students all the time. What are some of the differences in your mind in a black Muslim American woman's sense of modest fashion versus someone in Dubai or someone um, in, in India or someone in other parts of the Arab, um, Arabic diaspora? How do those, how do those concepts, how do you make it, how do you make it black? Um, I think one part of it is color. So I lived in Saudi Arabia for a year and I swore when I moved back, like I would never wear black again. I was like, this is never happening. <laughs> and um, that was one thing that I missed so much. There's so much expression and joy to be had in the color of something. Um, I think for me, I love a little bit extra and it could be extra anything glitter give me the glitter give me the sparkle give me the poofy sleeve give me the green, like, give me the drama the drama I want yeah, the zhuzh I want the zhuzh and the drama <laughs> I want all of the femininity and I want the flirty silhouettes and to me it's like you know sometimes it's redefining because if you say oh it's a sleek flirty Silhouette, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, a mini skirt. It can be right. layers. It can be volume. It can be ruffles. It can be floaty and feminine um, yes. and still very much in line with what I see myself as a full coverage designer. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I wanted to ask about, I, I believe you're connected with these two young, um, uh, other young um, Muslim women, Ain't Afraid. Oh, um, the, my sisters. I love them. <laughs> I love them. I love their music. They're I love their energy. The talent. So do, do, so do you know them at all? I mean, this is, I didn't yes, mean this, so is, I did not mean this to say all black Muslim women know each other. Right. I, I, saw you, I saw them on your page. And so I think you all had connected because I had, re I had, re I wrote to them last year saying, oh my gosh, I love to talk to you on the podcast. They're like, oh, we're, it'd be great, but we're so busy and we got the mm -hmm. album and we got the this. And I was like, okay, later, later. And so when I saw them with you, I was like, well, of course they know, of course they know Latari. I mean, <laughs> Of course, they know Latari. They are amazing, two amazing women, young women who are sewing and designing and oh, recording and making amazing hip hop music. And right. it's just fantastic. Oh and Latari is also the bomb.com and just straight fire. <laughs> so, why would they not know each other? Uh, and so, I guess I'm asked the question is what do you see in terms of your own work and influence on the younger generations of young black Muslim women? Um, because I feel like you are imparting something to them about what it means to navigate what could, what many can see is a very secular field, a very, you know, a style yeah. that kind of requires you to, you know, to show skin or to, to do things that are not in line with your values. Um, I think that, not to speak particularly particularly about them, um, but just in a general sense, I do get a lot of like, oh my God, I would have never thought to put that together or or like this is allowed or um, comments. Even I have a lot of, um, when I do shows or like campaigns and things, I get a lot of non-Muslim models that are just interested in working with me. And I've had people say like, wow, I've never thought I could feel so beautiful without showing anything. Um, and that to me is constantly the message that I want to reiterate. It's like, there's an option and I'm not 
dissing anybody. Like if you feel beautiful in your nudity or whatever you decide to wear, I'm not trying to negate that. Um, but I think that there is missing that balancing piece to say that's not the only option. That the only option of female empowerment is not, you know, nudity. It's like right. I'm also empowered. I'm also strong. I'm also in love with my body, in love with myself. Like, okay, honey. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, you are st- yes. Absolutely. I, I, I love you. the balance. Here's an I, <laughs> I love that about the balance. This is what's exciting to me because there is a way that the predominant conversation about female and for women, I say, I don't like to say female, okay, women's empowerment, girls' mm-hmm. empowerment has to do with allowing girls and women to have full control and autonomy over their bodies, yeah. period. That is what everybody should have, in my opinion. Every girl, every woman right. should have that right. And okay. yet, um, it seems to me that because of our Islamophobia or racism, that for when we have our Black Muslim sisters who choose to cover, you know, who choose to wear hijabs to school or to work or to whatever, it becomes something that's not allowed because we think that that's not, mm-hmm. and it's appalling, and it's really just racism, and it's really just because some people, you know, Islamophobes feel anxious when they see a Muslim woman in a hijab in the same way that some racists feel uncomfortable when they see a black person walking around alive, minding their own business, just you know, existing. just existing. Say that again. Say, excuse me. I exist. And like, I'm going to continue existing and I'm not going to apologize for it. Hey friends. Hey. The Stitch Please podcast is about to publish its 100th episode. That's right, 100 episodes. As part of the celebration, we are launching 100 by 100 to help us get 100 more Patreon supporters by the 100th episode publication date on September 15th, 2021. 100 additional Patreon supporters would give us the financial stability we need to hire editorial and production help. You can find the links to our Patreon in the show notes. Thank you so much for considering this and thank you current and future Patreon supporters. That is the absolute answer. That is the absolute answer. And so it, for me, when I, I want to talk to you more about volume. I, you talked a bit about color and how the importance of color can kind of brighten things up. And one of the contrasts you noticed from um, Saudi Arabia to to now when you're making your own decisions, not decisions, not, not that you are making decisions there, but the, yeah. the style, the more yeah. predominant style is the black, the full black hijab, the full black outfit. For mm-hmm. you, you're like, okay, that's not, I did that for a year. Now I'm back home and I'm going to get back to my roots in terms of color and style while maintaining um, and observing these traditions. What, what role does volume play? Because I don't think people think enough about the volume because I guess when we think about designing a silhouette that's Mm -hmm. flirty, for example, Mm -hmm. the flirty (laughs) is going to be either like, like I have like exposed shoulder or exposed Mm -hmm. knee or whatever. And you're saying, no, you can still maintain full coverage and still use, get flirty with ruffles or with, can we, can you talk about volume? Because that's something that, oh my gosh, that outfit that you had on just the other day, the black one (laughs) with the cape, I think it had a cape. It looked like it had wings. I don't know what all it had on. It was amazing. <laughs> so can you talk about volume? Because I don't often think about, I, I don't think about, I tend not to think about volume. I just mm-hmm. love that. Can you tell us more? So, yeah, I think like when you look at a lot of the silhouettes that are considered modest, right? Like you kind of get boxed in, right? Because it's like, well, it needs to be high collar. It needs to be this. It needs to be not too tight. And so for me, it's like, okay, I, these are, you know, the restrictions that I accept. Like I accept that I want it to be a high collar. I accept that I want it to not be super fitting. Okay. Now outside of these parameters that I accept, what are the things that I can play with? And it's always texture. It's always color. It's always volume. I am just 
a sucker for a good sleeve because I'm always going to wear sleeves. You know, like I'm every outfit I have has long sleeves. So give me poofy shoulders. Give me ruffles. Give me give, give me a, a good modified bishop. Add some extra stuff to it. Like, um, let me move my head. Let's see. You can see that a little yes. bit. Give me yes. some curves in the... Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You see the bottom, like the rosettes yes. and the rosettes. And, and so for me, I feel like, yes, I have my parameters that I that I work within based on, you know, my understanding of my religion and everything else is just up for expression. So a lot of times I'm just playing with whatever fabrics or materials I have in my studio. I I always say I do this for fun. I do this for work. I do this for therapy. I do this like I actually love it. And so I could be draping on my mannequin going, oh, I like the way this sticks up now. How can I make it stay? <laughs> like, it's like what, what kind of fabric? How much? I um I don't know if you saw that like beach shoot that I did. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> Yes, I did. Y'all, I'm going to put the link to uh, LaTerry's Instagram page in the show notes. Do yourself a favor and <laughs> follow her and go to her reels. I think that, I don't know if you saved, I hope you saved it as a highlight because, whoa. I need to get my highlights together. So, friends, don't worry. She's going to work on her highlights. Right. I'm and, gonna- by the time this airs, she will have that video shoot in there so you can go look at it because you will not want to miss it. So tell us, so about the shoot, you were saying that that helped, that was like a part of this vision that you were working on. And that, that dress, this, each sleeve for that dress was like two and a half yards of fabric oh by itself. Just oh because gosh. I was like, oh, what if it got bigger? <laughs> Like, what if I added more ruffles to this? What if I added more ruching? Um, and just playing around and experimenting until it got to a point where I was like, oh, I absolutely love this. And this is doing everything I want it to do. Um, and so for me, a lot of it is, I do do some sketching. Um, I do enjoy sketching. But a lot of it is working and making decisions on the fly as I'm working with the fabrics and the materials and looking at how things look together and how like I can drape and manipulate. It's, and that's one of the things I love about the way you talk about volume because it it's, it's such, when someone says like modest, um, that does not mean small. It does yeah. not mean yeah. to be so modest is not to be so small. It's not to yeah. make yourself smaller or to shrink. It's mm-hmm. to instead yeah. like you. And that's what volume to me says. Look, I am here. I am really here. And my dress is so fabulous that I'm going to zhuzh into the room and you will see like the train of my outfit. And as I'm walking, the train is dragging. And then when I turn around, the train is still dragging and I'm still back. It's like, it's not a dress, sis. It's an event. I mean, honestly, it's an event. The whole thing, it was just, it's just gorgeous. So I, I, I appreciate that. And at the same time that you're doing these very, I consider very radical moves, I think, to draw attention rather than like, you know, I don't know, I just find them very attractive and attractive in the sense of being very beautiful and very pretty. But also I tend to, when I see some of your pieces, I instantly lean in because I want to see the rest of the details. Mm-hmm. because I know I'm going to see um, a really experimental sleeve cap and I'm going to be like, how did she get that to stay up there? Or, you yeah. know, the way that you use ruching um, and the pleating techniques. Like all of these are like fundamental sewing basics that when manipulated can create something fantastic, mm-hmm. which is what you've shown us to do as well. Do you think there's a message there for sewists in general around how learning some of the fundamentals can be really helpful to creating something spectacular. Do you have any ideas or thoughts on that? What do you think? 
Absolutely. So, like, the way that my classes are structured is I'm teaching my students how to think about sewing, how to think about design. Um, very rarely do I actually say, here's the project, and guess what? All of us are going to make this exact project, and here's step by step by step by step. Now, oh, you executed it. Go away. Um, <laughs> Get out. <laughs> and tag me in your picture. <laughs> my goal is always to teach people how to make decisions like what is going to happen if I make this design using a chiffon versus a velvet? What is going to be different in the way that it looks and the way that it flows and the way that it drapes? Thinking about how to make decisions while also gaining those key skills. Here's how you do the action. Now, try it on this fabric. Try it on this fabric. Try it on this design. And look at and think about like in my um, intermediate class, we go through a pretty in-depth like list of fabric swatches and I'm having them go through and, and we're looking at, you know, here's a sketch of a design. Now, if you use this fabric, how would this ruffle look? How would it lay? How would it hang? Or is it going to be more voluminous? Is it going to be more, <laughs> you know, like, so thinking right. about right. how to make decisions, how these skills, like you're going to learn the core fundamental skills of sewing, how these skills translate into other things and how you can take that and manipulate patterns and manipulate, you know, the store-bought things to really create something that is your own and to really understand, like, what it, what might happen. Yes, what might happen. And that's, again, it goes back to the way that your work empowers people to do that which seems best and right for them. Right. And I, I think you, I, I really appreciate your teaching style because I learned in the way that you don't teach. I learned mm -hmm. from, okay, everybody, we're making a tote bag. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, now we're making a, a, a table runner that looks a lot like a tote bag, but without the, 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 <laughs> without the straps. And now we're going to move up to the placemat, which mm -hmm. again, looks like a tote bag and right. a table runner. <laughs> But like you are saying, you are giving people the skills and once they perfect the skills and understand the skills, which is a form of deep knowledge and deep right. learning. Like it's one thing to draw something and to sketch something. It's another thing to turn that vision into a reality. And you, not only are you doing that with your work, you are teaching other people how to do that. And that is an amazing and precious gift um, that you have and that you are extending. And I just want to thank you for that. I, I find it just incredible. Absolutely incredible. So tell us, Letary, what is up, what is next for you? What 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 is coming up next? What is uh, around the corner and down the street for you? Um, so I can't not talk about my summer camp girls. I need to mention them because Please I'm do. like Tell us. how mama, like, like I, I, oh my God, um, whew, just watching them progress. So, okay, let me back up a little bit. So the summer camp, we are in our fourth week now. And so what we do every day, our sort of motto is we're journaling, we're talking about, um, some, some mental health related topics. So we've talked about like managing anxiety. Um, and these topics are also laid out when they would be the most needed. Like I noticed that my mm. students get super anxious on fabric cutting day because they're like, oh. I don't want to make a mistake. So yes. on fabric cutting day, <laughs> before we start cutting the fabric, we're talking about anxiety and we're talking about ways to manage our anxiety. And we're talking about uh, you know, coping mechanisms and how to recognize so in ourselves, like, like some people, even how to recognize that we're feel our, our, our mood is shifting, our anxiety is rising. Like, you know, are you having trouble breathing or do you feel the, your physical temperature in your body changing? Oh um, and so I'm having these conversations with literal five and six year olds. <laughs> like, like, <sighs> So, it's, <laughs> I, and, and I, I wish that someone would have t given me the vocabulary for these kind of conversations when I was a six-year-old, mm -hmm. you know, because, 
you know, strong girls become strong women and not strong in the sense of strong black woman, like not like that, the way that they're always basically blaming us for surviving, right? This whole strong black woman thing and how we get penalized <laughs> for fucking living. Like, look at these strong black women over there being so strong and stuff. And I'm like, nobody wants me to crawl in a ball and die like is that what you expected because that's not what was going to happen (laughs) how about instead of like praising us for you know calling us strong black women as a backhanded compliment if that look think about the conditions that we have thrived in and the conditions in a country that was not built for us, built by us, but not for us, and all these systems and institutions that we helped to support but gained no or very little recognition and even less money and intergenerational wealth from, we yeah. survived, and then they still mad. You know what? Stay mad. Stay mad. But what you are doing <laughs> is telling these girls that, of course you have these feelings. This is totally normal, right? But this is not the whole story. That anxiety is a part of life. And mm-hmm. it's giving you information, right? But it's not give, It's not a prediction of a true and real outcome. So, right. hey, y'all, girls, cut the fabric. Right. You and cut the fabric. No mistake that we you, can't fix. <laughs> what? What's that? What would you say? There's no mistake we can't fix. That's exactly. Here. You're not exactly. alone in this process. We are doing exactly. it together and there's no mistake that we can't fix. Exactly. And there's no mistake because what you're doing is in this active process of constantly learning and growing. So sometimes it's like, thank you for making that mistake. Thank you for asking that question because <laughs> now we have now I have the opportunity to show you. <laughs> yeah. That's what we call them in class. Like, oh, that's a happy accident because that looks cuter than what you was planning to do <laughs> when you first started. <laughs> I, I love that so much. And also thinking about, at least something that I often think about, is the, no, the notions of creative liberation. And mm-hmm. that for so many Black women, we have had to build the things that we need. You know, we have had to build the things that we need. I'm going to go and, and with my computer. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So, we, and so what we're talking about is... In what ways do black women... And look, I got to see your whole outfit. Thank you for doing that. Y'all, you're going to wish you had a Patreon subscription. And honestly, if you don't have one, why not? It's like $2 a month. And everybody knows I'm worth way more than two doggone dollars a month. But you got to see this amazing outfit with this mid-sleeve, right? It's like a mid-sleeve. And that's the... It has pockets! I know, right? (laughs) It's in, it's, so, y'all, it's in my favorite color. It has pockets. The sleeves have drama. What I love about your sleeves is that they have drama and they're short sleeves because I love a drama sleeve, but I also will get my sleeve in my food anytime I eat. Um, but <laughs> so I'll have to have my, the shorts. That, that mid sleeve is perfect for me. Perfect. I can handle it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So this, the summer camp girls are just setting it on fire. They're doing great things. They're making new things. And then I see you work with adult clients as well, or adult students who yeah. also come in and learn basically about, you know, the ba- draping and sewing techniques and skills. And do you all do a show at the end of the year? Are you working on a show right now? Or I'm working on a show. So um, the end of August, we're going to have a show and we'll have a showcase with, um, the, all of the summer camp girls in their gowns, because we're doing formal wear. Um, and, oh, my God. Like, I have some pictures I need to post. Like, they they really did not hold back. I, I always, I laugh with my adult students, right, because I told my kids they never sold anything anything before. I was like, we're making gowns. And they were like, hell, yeah, okay, let's do it. I tell my adult students, we're making gowns. They're like, I I never worked with that material before. Um, I don't. Mm. <laughs> Am I involved in this, or is this really you doing it? And I get to watch. <laughs> so, um, the the summer camp girls they have their own segment in the show, and they're gonna model their their gowns. And then the show is also gonna be featuring two up and coming designers. Both were my students. Uh, so they're doing full collections, and then um, I'll be also presenting a collection. 
a new collection of pieces. And so when is the big day? So that what, is there any way that we can see this or can we, are you going to have live features or is there any way that someone from the general public who's not in your area can enjoy the show or participate or support? Um, so I'm working on videographer, photographers and seeing like what their capabilities will be as far as like live streaming. I, I had, I had some like really scary, terrible experiences in the bed in the past where I was like, Oh, this is really terrible. And so it's like, I need to talk myself over that and then try again. <laughs> like it doesn't have to be perfect. We're going to keep trying. <laughs> exactly. And the technology and accessibility questions yeah. are changing all the time. Right? So if you try to do a live show or live stream in the past, the, the technology might have been more challenging or the support mm -hmm. might not be there or the advice or whatever. But now it's so much more prominent. People are doing this so much more that mm -hmm. I, my, my hope is that you'll be able to get it, I'll get it, you'll be able to, my hope is that you'll be able to get it in such a way that everyone can see it. And I'm saying that just for purely selfish reasons so <laughs> that I can see it. I don't care really if everybody else sees it. I just want to make sure that I can see it. And I'm just pretending like I really care about um, other people and their ability to see it. So <laughs> I'm just going to pretend. Just... I'm just going to pretend like I'm a good person. And it's like, oh, you should do it for the benefit of humanity and myself. Um, but no, and the idea of watching your students grow into independent artists, how does that feel? Oh, I just brag. I'm not even, I don't even hold back. <laughs> like, you don't even have to ask me. I just like, oh, let me tell you. I will walk you into, like, oh, look what they made. <laughs> like, I'm a student. Um, so I'm out to eat at, like, this local sushi place. And I see a lady wearing a design that I know my student made. Like, and I'm just sitting here like, oh my God, oh my God. I, I, I like sneak and take a picture of the lady, like crop her face out. I text it to my student like, look what I saw. She was wearing your design, like you're famous. Like, <laughs> like oh I'm just like, I'm not here, I can't. I'm, I just, I'm constantly overwhelmed with joy. Um, I think, you know, like I said, my goal is to teach you how to make decisions, to teach you how to make your, your visions come to life. And so seeing that, oh, it, I am just, I'm over the moon. Um, I can't stop talking about my, like, <laughs> I know people tired of me, but it's okay. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Because you, we need you. We need you to do what you are doing so you can help sustain the radical and gorgeous and just beautifully empowering designs that you make, you know? So you have to be the one talking about it because who else is talking about it, you know? And I am just so inspired by the way that you have built what you needed and how you went out on a limb and you did this, you took this risk and it's paying off in multiple, in like in, in, like multiple ways. Like it's really like it's giving you something. It's showing your child what it means to pursue a dream. Um, it's showing the, the students that you have to come through that you can be yourself in any way and in any space and in any direction that you want. Mm -hmm. it, it's just all around a really wonderful project. Terry, seriously, it's just Thank amazing. So like, Thankly, that congratulations. Really a lot. I mean, that really does. <laughs> All right, so we're going to wrap up, y'all. And what we're going to do is I'm going to make sure that, te oh, Terry, tell us where we can find you on the socials. I know you have a YouTube channel. Tell us where we can find you. Okay. <laughs> so my YouTube is so modest. Um, my Instagram is so dot modest, and it's S E W dot modest. And you can also find me on Facebook. Um, it's so modest studio on Facebook. Um, and that's all of my accounts. Oh, I'm also on clubhouse, but I don't really know how to use it yet. So <laughs> we'll have to get you set up there with uh, black women stitch has a club on clubhouse and oh. yeah. So I, I, we should definitely extend the conversation there too. I would love that. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. This was so generous. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the invitation. Like, 
like I said, just you personally, as I've been following you and following your story and the way that you share and empower and, and really bring your full self to the craft, I was just like, this is exactly <laughs> the space I want to be in. Thank you and same. I am a mirror. I am I'm reflecting this. This is what I see in you. So I thank you. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out with, to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really, really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcast um, directories or services allow for reviews, but for those who do, for those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments, if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the Stitch Please podcast, that is incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together.